Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Interwell Water and Gas Tracer Technology. Thank you for taking your time and joining us today. I am Asiel, the Marketing Manager here in Resman, and together with me, I have Ed, our Technology Advisor in Middle East, based in Dubai, and Olaf, Discipline Lead for Reservoir Tracer Interpretation, based in Norway. Before we start, let me explain how you can talk to us during the webinar. We plan to have a live Q&A session in the end of the webinar today. So if you have any questions, just put them in the questions area on the right side of your screen, and we will aim to answer as many of them as possible. To those of you who are joining a little bit late, as we see more people are coming in right now, uh, or if you have to leave a little bit early, just drop us an email to communications at and uh, request a recording of the webinar and the presentation that we will be glad to send to you. Now we can begin, and I would like to invite Ed and lead us through the topic of reservoir information from the interwell traces. Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arcel. Um, yeah, my name is Ed Leong. I'm based in Dubai, as mentioned by Arcel. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us um, uh, in this uh, webinar, um, specifically around interwell tracing uh, using water or gas traces. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start off with an introductory slide um, about uh, traces in general. Um, I'd like to highlight that um, traces and the, the tracer information um, that, that we can derive is all based on um, transport of flow, whether the transport of flow is from in the well bore, around the near well bore, or between wells. So really traces are, uh, as I say here, a completely risk-free um, solution to monitor your well on its own. Uh, or, it's, or, the, or the reservoir. And um, the data we can obtain from traces um, is to, to assist you in optimizing production, um, identifying well vents, such as where is water breakthrough, uh, where is gas breakthrough occurring in your well. And, um, and thus, we'll be able to assist you in increasing hydrocarbon recovery with this type of uh, information and obviously increase the net present value of your producing assets. And the last point I mentioned on the left is the uh, the full field life cycle monitoring. I'm not sure many people are aware, but you can actually use traces from the time of startup of the well when the well is cleaned up. Uh, inflow tracer data can provide you that information about you know is the well cleaned up. Uh, are we verifying that the t can we verify that the toe is actually producing? So this is uh, in in terms of a new well, we can monitor the the life of the well from start till till many years uh, into the future. And traces are in general all tracer services uh, can be used uh, in a greenfield or in a brownfield application. Another thing to highlight is the multi-scale monitoring services. I just want to highlight that if you're looking at, if you're using inflow tracing, it's a, a monitoring solution that can mo monitor um, your, your formation that's less than a meter. Then we have services where we have traces that can monitor around the near well bore. And we're looking between one to 10 meters of, of surveillance around the well bore. And what we're going to focus on though today is the uh, the flow in the reservoir, where traces can be used to monitor from 100 meters well spacing to thousands or tens of thousands of, of meters apart. So I just want to highlight that that the tracer services Resman offers uh, can be le from less than a meter to thousands of meters. So there's lots of different tracer services um, that I wanted you know, you, you to be aware of. And, you know, putting this all together, uh, the, the trace information, the value information traces provide you 
is to yeah of course reduce uncertainty in in your modeling and your in your predictions in history matching and therefore come up with better decisions and and thus better economics as well so this second slide is just summarizing the um, solutions uh, with traces so the first one is the the permanent inflow traces and they're basically traces that are installed uh, in new wells usually uh, in the completion when it's run in hold. So it's sitting there uh, permanently monitoring your uh, production wells. To enable um, monitoring such as uh, quantifying flow, how much comes from each zone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, well cleanup, verifying that, and also knowing where water breaks through. Um, Multi-rate testing. So when we do multi-rate testing, we're taking steady state samples regularly um, at different steady state rates. So we can identify what is the operating envelope of your producing well. You don't want to produce too hard because you may cone water. You don't want to produce too low because you may not get enough drawdown um, over some zones. And the last point is about continuous monitoring, and that's about really um, taking regular samples, let's say every two weeks or, or once, a, once a month, to look at the, the trends uh, of, of the tracer flux uh, over time. Uh, but what we're going to be focused on are really the, the pumpable tracers, specifically the passive, the uh, interwell tracer tests using water and gas tracers. However, there are other categories of pump, uh, pumpable tracers as well, such as frac tracers for multi-stage fracking monitoring to assess um, uh, frac efficiency, for example, um, single well chemical tracer test, which is measuring residual oil saturation around the near bore from several meters to about 10 meters into the around the well bore, and partitioning into well tracers um, to be able to measure the res residual oil between wells that are connected to each other. In other words, the injector and, and producers. But in this particular um, webinar, we're going to be focused on the first point, which is really the, the passive into our tracer test with case studies. And the last point, I just want to highlight: um, tracer data can be, you know, can be and should be um, loaded uh, into uh, your models, whether they're wellbore models, sector models, or reservoir simulation models. And and we do have easy access to load data into commercial products from Schlumberger, for example, in Petrel, where a plugin has been developed. And you can visualize results um, and the uh, interpretations. Um, and, and of course, traits data can be very easily loaded into um, databases and then perform data, data mining analysis on the tracer information with global production data and other information that, um, that you have for your well and your field. So as I mentioned, we're, we're focused in this webinar about interwell tracing, and um, the typical uh, interwell tracer tests are the pump the passive traces in water injectors, gas injectors, uh, CN2 injectors if you're performing EOR, um, WAG, EOR, water alternating gas processes, and, and other EOR uh, techniques. And what can we understand from interwell tracer tests. Um, very important to, to, to know where uh, when breakthrough time occurs, um, the communication between wells, um, how much that you've uh, how much is produced versus how much you've injected um, in the well in, in, in terms of uh, tracer mass. And you know all this information we can derive how much volume is swept in your reservoir and how efficient it is. Uh, assess the flow heterogeneity between wells uh, as well, and, and thus this information can be used to improve your, your reservoir modeling. And the other interwell tracer test, which, which we won't focus too much today, uh, is, is the partitioning tracers uh, that can be uh, used uh, after a, a, a ward injection campaign. Uh, or an EOR process before and after to assess the residual oil change. 
Um, and it's primarily used, yeah, to, to evaluate EOR pilot or, or full field EOR deployment. So what kind of information can we derive from interwell tracing? Uh, first of all, on the left-hand side, we have this uh, connection um, point, which obviously just tells us uh, which wells are in communication uh, with each other. And in this case, you see injection, in injector one is in communication with producers one and two, and in injector two, they're in connection with um, producers two and three. So that's probably the, the simplest interpretation you, know, you can do. Uh, going to the right, flower, flower location is just um, telling us, you know, how, how, how much we've uh, injected versus how much is produced uh, from the producers. So as you can see, they're both connected, but the injector two with producer three is, you could say, a more important connection because more producers have, uh, more traces have been uh, produced versus um, production two. And just knowing this connection uh, uh, enables you to rank the importance of your injector producer relationships. On the bottom left hand quarter is about sweep, sweep efficiency. So if we know the time of breakthrough and we know how much, you know how much you're injecting, you can determine, you know, your sweep efficiency uh, between your connected wells as well. Um, and then on the right, the oil saturation, this is about using um, partitioning traces uh, with uh, your passive tracer. So what you've just seen in the animation is that the blue tracer is the water tracer that is designed to really flow with the design. It's, it, it's what is de being designed to flow with, which is water. Um, and it just flows through the permeability to the production well. But the red tracer you saw uh, basically uh, is designed to have an infinity or partitioning to the water phase and the oil phase. The oil phase being the um, stagnant oil that is um, surrounding the, the sand grain. And it will delay um, its arrival to the producer because it has that affinity or, or that partitioning um, uh, incorporated in it to, to go between water and oil. So, and based on the arrival of the partitioning tracer and the time of breakthrough of the passive tracer, um, with the partitioning coefficient, which we measure in the lab, uh, we can estimate the residual oil saturation between uh, injector and producer wells. So this is just a, a, a summary of, of all the different applications that we have for, for interwell tracing. So this uh, slide summarizes what I've, I've been um, discussing in a, in a holistic sense. Um, we can see that uh, when you're developing your your models, you'll have seismic interpretation, log interpretations, well test data, core data, and, and tracer data. And all this can be incorporated in your, in your models, in your static model, and then a simulate, uh, and then simulating that in, the, in a dynamic model. And of course, they produce forecasts and, and economics can be um, uh, derived from it. And, and thus you'll be able to make uh, you know, field development decisions. Now, tracers, uh, you know, how, how can they be used in, in the workflow, in the modeling workflow? Well, there's one with I, I'm calling the short loop tracer input, which is basically the inflow tracer technology and also the, um, the estimating residual oil saturation around the well bore. So this information can be incorporated into a well model, perhaps a steady state model, or could be into a sector model of a reservoir simulator or, or in, in a full field simulator, it's because you'll be able to get information such as quantification, where is water breaking through, at what time, which well, which location, and also residual oil saturation information. 
to calibrate your, um, your models. Now the interwell tracing will give you um, a better understanding about, about the structure of, uh, of your geology, of your reservoir, your, con your connectivity between wells, of course, the time of water breakthrough, uh, sweep efficiency. So that information can also be inputted to your, to your reservoir model. And yeah, using the short loop and, and long loop tracer input will provide you that va value of information where you can reduce uncertainty uh, and understanding of your reservoir and hence make better decisions and better economics. So now I'll uh, pass the floor to uh, Olaf Husabi, um, who will go through uh, practical case studies um, with Interwell Tracer solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Before uh, we will continue with some case studies, a quick reminder to those of you who joined the webinar a little bit later than we started. We see some questions coming in to Ed, who just finished presentation on how, where and how Resman Tracer data is used. Thank you for those. We will answer them in the end of the session. Please continue and bring your questions in. And in the meantime, I would like to suggest Olaf to share the case studies that we prepared for you today. Olaf. Um, thank you, Asel, and thank you, Ed. Um, I will... Uh... See if I can get the slides moving. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, it's a good idea to to go through some of the fundamentals uh, on the methodologies that we're going to use to understand the field cases that we will be presenting today. Uh, so I will try to make a recap on um, the so-called residence time distribution. Uh, method uh, and how how this can be used to to understand the um, the sweep volume and uh, the importance of um, of the individual connections in the field. So RTD uh, analysis, in a way, it's uh, it's looking at the traces as a streamline. Um, uh, as taking a streamlined view of the of the reservoir. We see the particles moving, moving in the reservoir, and um, you can think of each of these traces as tracking individual streamlines in the reservoir. And uh, of course, each of the tra tracer particles will spend a time depending on how how long this streamline took to come to the to the producer. So, by counting in specific time intervals how many traces are arriving we can build up a distribution of the times spent in the reservoir uh, by the tracers, and this is the residence time distribution. Um, now, of course, we cannot sit uh, in the well and, and count, so we have to use some other way of doing that. And the good thing is that concentrations are actually very close to numbers. So we can use the concentrations to, to count how many tracer particles arrive. Uh, concentration is amount divided by volume. Um, so if we multiply that by a production volume, we have number of particles per, uh, or, or kilograms of traces per time, and that corresponds to a number. So that's how we're going to, to do the, uh, to build up the residence time distribution from the tracer uh, concentration curves. And uh, if we look at the, uh, the heterogeneity in the reservoir uh, and the heterogeneity of the flow, that will affect how these residence time distributions look like. So if we compare the red one and the green one in the, in the figure, we see that the green one corresponds to a heterogeneous flow where the, the arrival of the trace particles have been shifted towards early times. So that means essentially that a larger part of your tracer mass arrives early on. I, I will go through this in, in some detail. Uh, so if we just plot a very simple uh, simple case with, uh, with a few traces, we have one 
injector on the top left of this uh, figure, and we have a producer on the on the right uh, bottom right. Um, we th there's always particle arriving first, obviously. So this is your your particle that arrives first. So you you have the concentration, you have the production rate, so you can find how many particles this correspond to. Then we have a couple of um, of particles arriving as number two, so that starts building up your your uh, resonance time distribution. And then, of course, we have more particles arriving. You have four four particles arriving, and then eventually you have two particles which are a bit late compared to the others. And now you have actually built up your resonance time uh, dis distribution uh, in the um, in the in the reservoir. So how long the trace is used to come on uh, to the to the producers um, and uh, if we if we start looking at the uh, the effect of a heterogeneity uh, we will we will see that more more particles arrive in the beginning and that that affects that shifts the 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 distribution towards earlier times So uh, if we start looking at the, the details of this uh, distribution, we can, uh, because this is a distribution, we can quantify what's known as the moments of the distribution. So the zero order moment is the area under the curve. So essentially the integral over all times of this, uh, of this distribution. The first order moment is time multiplied by the distribution and then uh, integrated. And the interesting point with these moments is that the zero order moment corresponds to the importance of the connection. That's the total mass arriving at the given producer. The first order moment is very closely related to the average travel time of the distribution. And as Ed mentioned in the beginning, if we have the times and, and we have the injection rates, we essentially know the swept volume, and you can see that in the in the in the last uh, uh, equation, the the volume swept corresponds to the injection rate times the average time. I will go in even more detail and see how this looks like in our concrete example. So, uh, if we if we don't think about the integrals, you just think about the boxes that you see in the in the distribution. Essentially. M0 is the number of boxes. That's the, the total amount of, of tracers uh, arrived at this particular uh, producer. The this first order moment corresponds to uh, this time integral. So essentially, we have the time three, which has one box, plus times four, which has four boxes, uh, time five, which have, uh, sorry, time four, which have two boxes, time five, which have four boxes, time six, which have two boxes. And if you do the calculation, you see that M1 is 43. And now, interestingly, if we divide this by nine, we get the average uh, residence time, uh, which is 4.7 in this particular case. And we see that this is close to what's called the mode of the distribution, which is the most popular or the most common uh, uh, arrival time. So we can, by relatively simple means, characterize the, the arrival times of the traces, and we can calculate how long they spend in the reservoir on average between the injector and the producer, and how many of them moves between the injector and the producer. So this was a little bit detailed, but but I think it gives a good background for the field cases. So I'm going to show you the the first field case now. Um, oh, actually, let's let's re let's just uh, summarize very briefly uh, what we just said. Essentially, when you inject a certain amount of tracer into a well, you can use the the RTD to find how much comes into each of the producers. Um, you can use the average time that we showed how to calculate, multiply that by the injection rate, and then uh, multiplying it by the fraction going to one specific producer, and you can find the sweat volume between this injector and this particular producer. So getting a full overview of the, of the 
the connections, the importance of the connections, and the, the swept volume between the injectors and the producers. So now we'll go to the first field case. Um, uh, which is a water case where we used uh, tracers to study the effect of uh, a polymer injection into a field in uh, Austria. You can find a full reference in the in the literature if you want to. Uh, essentially, uh, onshore field distance between the wells is in the few hundred meters. Um, there was a historic tracer injection done uh, previously, uh, and uh, we re-entered with a tracer after the polymer injection. So I'm going to focus on the on the field case after the the polymer injection and compare it to what we saw before the polymer was injected. So. Um, this gives you an outline of the of the field. Essentially, we have an injector S81, um, and there is an injector SC1, which are the the two uh, in blue. So essentially, this one and this one, and we injected traces into both of these injectors. Um, we then uh, recorded the, the tracer concentrations between each of the injectors and producer pairs that you see coming up now. And I think it makes sense to look, look a little bit close just at the tracer data itself, uh, just, just without doing any RTD analysis of, of this data. So uh, first of all, we see that we don't find any tracer in S79, and also we don't find any tracer in S83, which essentially means that, that the tracer has a, has a movement towards the northeast and a little bit towards the south. So that's the main uh, connections in the field. Essentially, there's a, there's a drive towards these, uh, these wells. Nothing is going down here, and not, nothing is going towards the west in, the, in this particular pattern. Uh, we can also uh, note that uh, there are sort of double bumps in the uh, in the figures. That is probably related to to uh, some um, uh, structure in the in the reservoir. I won't go too much into detail on that. What I will mention is that we see that all the tracer curves are sort of um, we, we want the, the analysis we want the results before we have the, the complete tail of the tracer curves and in order to do that we have to extrapolate the, the, the curves and that's the the orange dotted line that you can see in the figure that's an extrapolation based on a simple model uh, that uses the, the tracer data to get to the full uh, uh, residence time uh, distribution so the actual residence time distribution we use is a combination of the measured data and an extrapolation towards infinity for the for the tracer curves. So if we follow uh, all these steps, we have collected the tracer data. We know the production rates in each of these uh, injectors. Uh, we have built up our residence time distribution according to the method that we described earlier. Uh, we can now start to look at the results of the of the RTD. And if we look at the um, the, the width of these arrows uh, that you see, uh, we have uh, essentially a, a large movement towards S65, a little less towards X66 and S81. And we also have uh, a considerable movement towards uh, S54 from the separate injection in SC1. Using these fractions, how much is going into each direction, together with the injection rate and together with the average time that we find from the residence time distribution, we can calculate the swept volume. And the swept volume in this figure has been illustrated with ellipses. And the way we draw these ellipses is we take we know approximately the, the, the height of the formation and we know the, the, the volume from the, from the calculations and that gives us an area which is used to illustrate how large uh, part of the reservoir is covered by the, 
by the flow after polymer was injected. Um, and uh, we also write down the swept volume in these uh, individual cases. So we see that there's about 8,100 cubic meters from uh, S81 towards S65. And it's important to keep in mind that these are real volumes. These, this is actually the volume that has to be uh, filled with water in order before the average tracer arrives to the producer. So this is this is a concrete physical volume in in the reservoir and can be can be compared to to the volumes that you expect um, to be swept between the injector and the producers. Now, the, the 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 objective of this particular case was to compare swept volume before polymer was injected and after polymer was injected. So if we look at what happened um, uh, previously before the polymer. Uh, we actually had a swept volume, which is the blue, the blue ellipse that you see in the figure. I'll point to it, this thing essentially. And that corresponds to this, uh, this uh, uh, function that you see on the, on the top right. And we see that the swept volume before the polymer was injected was about 3,100 cu cubic meters. And after polymer was, was injected, we see that we have a much larger swept volume. And you can actually see it directly in the tracer curves or in the, in the residence time distribution. You see that the, the average time has been drawn towards the right. So you, you have increased your average residence time in the, in the reservoir. And of course, that gives you a larger swept volume. So in this particular case, the tracers are a very concrete proof that polymer is working in this uh, particular case. And if we think back uh, to, the, to the original figures, you might remember that there were uh, two colors. There was a light blue and a, and, a, and a more yellow part of the curve. Essentially, if I point to the after the after polymer injection, I had a, uh, I sort of have one, one trace of behavior in the beginning there and one at the end. And that could point to two layers in the reservoir. And if we compare the, the tracer curves directly, we see that something has happened to one of these layers. Essentially, the first one is not that much affected by the polymer. It's more that you have stretched one of the layers in, in time and you have increased the sweat volume in that part of the tracer curve. So that's, of course, you can, you can start building up more interpretation into the, into the tracer data once you have done the, the first uh, analysis. So that was uh, the first key field case I wanted to, to uh, look at. Uh, the second field case we're going to focus on is a gas case from the North Sea. Uh, it's uh, one of the early water alternating gas uh, cases in the North Sea. So it's, you can see the, the full reference uh, uh, on the left, uh, bottom left. Uh, and there was a, this was a large campaign. So, so inject, uh, we injected gas traces in, in many of the injectors and looked for it more or less in all the producers. I'm going to be focusing on, on one particular uh, well pair, but uh, I will just remind ourselves that we can, of course, make uh, an overview of, of the field uh, using the, the RTD methods that we already discussed. Uh, finding the connections, quantifying the importance of each connection. You see the recoveries on the uh, on the second column in the uh, in the table. Uh, essentially, uh, we find these numbers by by uh, by counting how much is coming out in each well, and and uh, and comparing it to to what was injected in the uh, in the injector, uh, and that gives us. Uh, a ranking of the importance of each of these connections, just as Ed mentioned, and just as we saw in the in the previous uh, water case. So that's uh, sort of an introduction to the to the case. I'm going to look at one particularly interesting uh, uh, connection. It's um, if you look at the the map, you see that there is a there's a fault or a, there the are fault in these uh, in this reservoir, and actually rotated fault blocks. And if you think of a or a, of a horizontal fault, uh, horizontal uh, geological structure that's rotated, you create like a, in a way, an, an attic, um, sort of a, 
uh, a loft of the where you can have volumes and you may think that these are closed or maybe they're not closed these are things you want to to find from the traces so if we uh, look at the one uh, uh, one particular connection it's actually the connection between p28 and p29 which we are primarily interested in but we also uh, highlight the um, uh, uh, one tracer injected in P25, which corresponds to the blue arrow uh, down here. Now, if you look at uh, the injections in P28, we actually repeated this injection three times uh, with approximately one year between each of the injections. So in this particular well, we have injected different tracers three times. In this well, we have injected one tracer one time. Um, we will look first at the connection between P25 and P29, so the blue the blue line. So it's a little bit uh, not too logical. This, this should have been blue, but it's red. So the red curve corresponds to the blue arrow. Um, what we see is that, uh, and, and I should also mention that in the figure, the, the gray line in the background is the, the gas oil ratio in the field. So what we see is that this tracer actually arrives fairly fast. It was injected in March 94. We see the tracer already in, uh, in June uh, 94. Uh, and it comes before you have any significant increase in the, in the gas oil ratio. And that essentially means that this, tra this tracer, uh, this gas tracer has followed the gas into the oil and is moving together with the oil towards the producer and comes out. Uh, um, when, once you start producing the oil and you have the associated gas coming out of the, or the, or the injected gas which was which went into the oil phase is coming out and then you see the tracer coming out. Now, if we look at the three other tracers, the three tracers injected in um, in P28, and I think the color scales are probably a little bit more uh, sensible here. So the green one actually corresponds to the to this uh, green one. The, the purple one to this one and the blue corresponds to this one. So remember, these were injected with a time difference of about one year between them. So, and they all arrive at the same time, which is a bit strange. And they all they all arrive when the when the gas oil ratio starts increasing. So this means that they must have they must have stopped somewhere on the way and and stay there for some time before. They, they started uh, uh, spilling over to the producer. And this actually corresponds very well with these rotated fault blocks. So this is actually uh, the, one of these fault blocks. Uh, imagine that, that this line that I'm pointing to now is the, the, the top of the, of the attic. And um, it, it has the, the ability to capture gas and uh, and store the gas for some time uh, before the, the volume is full. And then when the volume is full, the gas spills over, all the traces arrive at the same time at the producer. So that's that's the interpretation of the of the, the gas traces in this uh, particular case. So we see that there is actually uh, an abundance of useful information from the traces. We, we know that uh, for some for some wells, the gas goes into the oil. It it brings the the it helps bring the the oil towards the producer. It also um, and and the gas traces follow the the gas. In other cases, you have volumes, relatively large volumes, that you fill up with gas before it spills over. And remember, you also know the the injection rates of this gas, so you can have some idea. Of the, the the magnitude of this of this attic uh, volume in the in the reservoir, all very useful information. Um, now, of course, uh, as Ed uh, pointed to, it makes good sense to treat the tracer data just as any other production data, just as any other data you have in the in the reservoir. Um, in this particular case, we uh, use the tracer data to update uh, the simulation model. The original simulation model didn't have this attic uh, gas uh, storage volume. Uh, 
uh, and of course it was impossible to to capture the the movement of the traces so the the figure you're seeing on the right uh, highlights one of the traces one of the attic one of the traces that was stored in the attic volume is is the is the blue blue points the green line is the model results when you don't have any storage volume and of course you don't match your 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 data and in order to 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 get a good match and in order to understand what goes on you have to add um, uh, a storage volume in your simulation model and tune this volume until you get a match between the data and your uh, simulation and what you gain in the end is obviously a simulation model which is much closer to reality and then when you have a model which is closer to reality we can start uh, trusting the the predictions from from uh, this model so you end up using the tracer data with um, with an understanding of the subsurface which is much more detailed than than what you would have if you didn't uh, use any any tracer data and i think it's this ability uh, it's this ability of of quantifying so first establishing the fact that you have connections in your reservoir the ability to to rank the importance of these connections they can be very important or they can be more or less unimportant depending on how much tracer mass you actually find in your in your producers and you can also quantify how effectively you have uh, swept your your pore volume between the injectors and the producers uh, so they they as as ed uh, mentioned they they tie into this to this long modeling uh, cycle where you are uh, gradually improving your your understanding of the subsurface giving you better predictions from from your models it can also be used on a shorter uh, cycle like uh, ed mentioned we have the, the inflow traces that that can be used for production optimization we also have some field cases where you have extremely rapid breakthrough of, of water and if you want to know where this rapid breakthrough comes from you can add traces to your injectors and you can you can you can pinpoint the the, the offending uh, injector the one that creates a, a huge massive breakthrough into your producer so interval or pumpable traces are also relevant in this short uh, uh, short cycle now we saw in the in the first field case that the traces can also help in uh, in making uh, uh, field development decisions if you wonder whether or not your your it's a good idea to use polymers you should always use traces verify if your swept volumes are increased by by the by the traces of course any other methods that you uh, are thinking of uh, could also be verified using using tracer data um so i think we are uh, approaching the the end of the of the presentation and i will give the word back to Sel. yeah thank you wolf and thanks for the great uh, overview of the case studies let's look into the questions that we have received and we will try to answer as many of them as we can uh, uh for to those questions that we will not be able to answer we will also come back in uh, in written so the first question is uh, what software can can read tracer info it says so who would like to answer this one maybe ed yes uh, um, i i did mention there was, there was one uh, product software we we developed um, to read um, inflow tracer information and is compatible with uh, summer j petrol product um and, and then and then we've also got some compatibility with uh, uh roxar's rms as well through keywords um and in general though you know the, the tracer data can be quite easily incorporated um with and without you know uh, tools uh, that we've, we've developed as well but um it, it just depends on the the product you're using and most of them you can you know, load in through ASCII, ASCII files as well, um, the information, yeah. All right. 
this address your question another question is in petrel uh plugin simulation are partitioning traces also considered so are they considered obviously this is a question yeah, yeah i can yes okay yeah do you, if you want i can maybe answer that ed or do you want to no that's fine no, you, you go ahead uh, Olaf. so i think uh, what i can say about the partitioning traces is that um they are uh, available uh, in uh, in the general uh, simulation software so so they should be available in uh, in petrel they're not they're not part of the plugin that uh, that we provide but it's uh, so so you would treat it more as as you would with ordinary uh, uh, production data like like production rates or, or things like that so I think that's the the easiest way of incorporating uh, interval traces into the into the simulators. Thank you. I hope this is answering your question. Uh, if further clarifications are needed, please just type in the questions again. Another question is how long it takes to receive results. Ed, would you like to answer this one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, typical turnaround time is um, uh, around uh, two weeks, um, and that in that would include the samples being taken from the well site and uh, being uh, arriving in our laboratory in Norway, uh, where all the um, analysis is is performed, uh, QC'd, and then interpreted. So. Turnaround time average is uh, two weeks. All right. Ed, another question. How much do you rely on accuracy of reservoir model? In other words, how do you take into account the reservoir uncertainty for interval tracer results? Yeah, so I can answer that one. So remember that the, the tracer data are independent of the model. They are, in fact, a way of proving or disproving a model so we don't take any uh, we don't have any any assumptions based on the on the simulation models for the for the tracer projects they are independent data sets and your model should match that data set if it doesn't it essentially means that you have uh, something in the model that does not capture the, um, the physical situation and then the only way to, to fix that is to fix your model and whether or not that's a, a very large uh, thing to fix or it's, it's a smaller thing to fix, you still have to do it because it essentially the, the traces prove that there is a mismatch between reality and, and your model. But it's, um, and we saw it in, in one of the, um, in the gas case uh, example, the original model uh, didn't have this attic volume uh, um, incorporated into it. That's the, the, the attic volume is a physical reality and the traces reveal that this physical reality is there. And then when the model does not match, you have to change your model. So uh, of course, that, that, that's, there's some work involved in changing the model, but you have to do it. And the benefit is that you get uh, much better predictions from your, from your model. You can use your model to then predict other scenarios uh, that, that are relevant. All right, thanks, Olaf. Another question, are your traces moving only with the gas phase? Yeah, I can, uh, I can answer that one. Uh, the fact is that there are no such thing as a, as a tracer that follows only the, the gas phase. Um, so all traces from all, uh, uh, all vendors will, uh, gas traces that is, will be oil gas partitioning traces um, and you can understand that if you think uh, of the simplest tracer you can think of let's say that you have a, a tagged uh, uh, methane molecule uh, reservoir gas will be a mixture of methane and, and and other gases and pure methane itself will will not uh, behave exactly as the the, the gas phase so there is no such thing as a, as a pure gas tracer. However, they have different properties. And if you combine different tracers, you can infer how much 
uh, of the movement is based on uh, on movement with the oil and how much is based on movement with the gas so gas traces are inherently a little bit more they have more complicated behavior than the water traces the water traces itself uh, moves only what with the water face all right thanks olaf next question for simulation of tracer flow which analytical technique will you recommend method of characteristics method of moments or simple old buckley leverage well i guess it depends on uh, on your on your specific case uh, mm. if you have um, uh, simple uh, questions you want to answer uh, you can use simple simple uh, methods what i would say about the, the method modes of the, or the rtd method that, that we presented the advantages is that it's it's really straightforward and, and fast to do if you have, we have a workflow that that treats this uh, method in a in an efficient way uh, and then it's uh, it's relatively straightforward to do that uh, that thing um, simulation models uh, if you have a simulation model for your field i would always recommend that you add traces to that model because it will reveal uh, problems or potential problems in the model uh, but if if you're looking for simple models i my my method of choice is is rtd all right thanks all for the recommendation somebody is asking thanks for the webinar will the recording will be available for viewing later yes we will distribute the recording and the materials to those who attended thanks for asking uh, next question is in your figure 16 i see double peaks can you explain this behavior yeah that was uh, i was partly touching uh, into that uh, already so uh, if we recall back, we saw that there was um, uh, a blue line and a, and a, and a yellow line, uh, and it was consistent in all the, maybe we can bring up the, the, the figure actually, Let's see if we can bring it back so we can yeah. comment on it. Which key study was uh, it? It was one of the first ones. Yeah, this one. This one. Yeah, if we look at this, so so we see the, the the blue and the yellow part of the curve, and you also see that the the dotted line, which is our simple uh, model match to the uh, to the case, actually shows that there are uh, two behaviors in the in the field. One one is um, is uh, the the blue uh, the blue blue part of the curve that sort of arrives in the beginning. It, it either creates a, a shoulder in the figure, like in in S66 and in S54, um, uh, you see this one and, and this one, or you have actually clear double peaks, like in this case, and actually also in, in this case. And since it's consistent in, in many producers, it means that it's a field-wide uh, effect. It, it doesn't occur in just one of the wells, it actually occurs in, in, in all the wells. So my the, the simplest interpretation of this is that you have two separate two layers which are are separate in a way that it's not easy for the fluid to go from one of the layers to the others, and one of these layers um, produce fluid faster than the other that corresponds to the blue one, and one layer uh, produce uh, fluid uh, uh, slower that corresponds to the yellow one, and. Uh, and that that what causes the this double peak the behavior. Now we did an RTD of the um, the full curve. Of course, there's nothing that stops us from doing an RTD on the individual curves, so on the individual layers in this uh, in this model. And uh, if you go in the um, in the um, uh, reference given uh, on this page, you will see some more discussion on this uh, on this topic and you will see that we could actually uh, uh, infer the the swept volume on a layer basis and also how much of the fluid uh, was moving in each of the layers in the uh, in the field so you can by by, by squeezing more uh, information uh, from from the tracer data get a, a very good overview of uh, of what goes on in this uh, in this particular field case 
Thanks, Olaf. Next question is the sweep volume change. Was it compared with producer rates? Did the well production correlates with this trend? Um, yeah, I think I would have yeah. to refer to the to the paper for for the details on uh, on that. There was some. Uh, the, the, there is this paper, and there is also a few other papers on this uh, field case that that you can go into and, and and verify. Yeah. So to the person who has asked this question, we can come back with uh, some yeah, yeah. some references, right? Thanks. Let's. Uh, we have some minutes more to answer a few of the questions that we have received. Um, typically, how much tracer we expect to recover from the injected amount? Ah, that varies a lot. Uh, so if you have a, a very dramatic short breakthrough between an injector and, and producer, you can sometimes find back uh, almost all the tracer injected. Uh, in other cases, you will find uh, five, ten percent, and really, you don't want to see too much of your tracer, because if you see all your tracer coming back, it essentially means that your injected water goes directly to the producers. So, so it does vary a lot. Uh, you, of course, have to make sure that you have a good lab that analyzes the tracer data, uh, because you want you want uh, a non-observation of tracer to actually be uh, be real. That it's not. Uh, it doesn't mean that you uh, have injected too little tracer, for instance. So, but if if you're confident in your in your tracer survey uh, and you 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 really believe that the the, uh, the data is uh, is good, you can um, you can find very very low uh, recoveries. There is actually one field case that that we uh, that I think you can find on our web page where we found back uh, less than one percent of the injected tracer. Still, very important uh, results because it showed that that the flow between the injector and producer was going into the aquifer, maintaining pressure, but not producing a lot of traces. And then we have other cases where you where we find back almost all the tracer. Yeah. Thanks. There is one question around the case studies. Are there any case studies of using traces in offshore? So I guess we can. Yeah, actually, one of yeah. the case studies we showed today is offshore. Yeah. The the VAG study was a offshore case. Uh, there, there are several. There are many many field cases. Yeah. So we can also to the person who asked about this, we can send some links to the case studies that we have. Another question: Can we use it? For SAGD, so I guess it's the steam-assisted gravity drainage yeah. uh, application. Can we use it? Yeah. For so it? the uh, the the general question is yes, but you have to be careful with your traces because uh, the the temperatures will be high in a SAGD, so we will have to design uh, the traces study specifically for for the temperatures that, that you are uh, looking at. But it, it, in general, yes, but uh, we, it needs some planning. All right. What is the frequency? Oh, there, there are more questions coming. Let's see, we have two minutes left. What is the frequency of sampling needed to monitor properly the traces? Yeah, it's... Um, uh, uh, I, I, usually, we so, so it's also part of the detailed design of a tracer study, uh, and we are usually cautious. So in the beginning, we will have frequent sampling. Uh, then we can relax the sampling over time uh, if we don't see very fast breakthroughs. We would like to uh, to spread our, our uh, concentration measurements in a sensible way over time, so so that we cover the, the tracer curve in time as, as well as possible. So, but very uh, typical numbers, uh, sort of uh, uh, average numbers would be maybe every two weeks in the beginning and, and relaxing to monthly samples uh, over time. That would be a very typical scenario. But of course, if you have a fast breakthrough in, within a couple of days, then you need much much more frequent sampling. All right, thank you, Olaf. Unfortunately, the time is running, and it, this was the last question we could answer today, but we will come back to all the questions you have brought to us in a more one-to-one -one conversation. Uh, we need to make some important announcements. This is the second webinar out of series to come, 
and we have prepared interesting and challenging topics to discuss with you. Please let us know if there is any specific question you would like our technology experts to address in the next session. Just bring them uh, to, just email them to communications at resman.no and we will make sure to arrange something for you. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. We, have, we hope to see you all again next time. Thanks for today again. Goodbye.